glory of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Well, I'm one of five kids in my family, and growing up on the younger end of five kids, having all those siblings, one of the best parts was that in my high school and college years, I went to a lot of weddings. And it was always so much fun because we danced a lot. And not because we're good dancers in my family, because we're not scared that we're really bad dancers. And there was no you know, social media or smartphones back then. So nothing was gonna end up on Facebook. Everyone we love gathered from all over the country together for a long weekend, food, great meals, lots of pinochle, beautiful wedding, great party. Those are some of my favorite memories in life. And those weddings and the marriages that began there have been hugely um, influential on my life. They've shaped the trajectory of my life and our family's life. My sisters all married great guys. My parents now have 14 grandchildren. So these were a huge part, like most families, of, of our shared memories and the trajectory that was set for our family for the rest of our life into eternity, as it turns out. Well, what we find today is that God loves a good wedding party. Our Lord's first miracle is recorded at a wedding party. And this is not totally unexpected or arbitrary and random. The Bible opens with the creation of marriage with Adam and Eve. And the Bible ends with the marriage supper of the Lamb, with Jesus as the bridegroom and the new Israel. And in between those two bookends, we hear a whole lot about marriages in the Bible. God describes his own relationship with Israel as a marriage that begins with a ceremony of wedding vows on Mount Sinai. There's even a feast. Weddings are a big part of the Bible. They're a big part of how God reveals himself to us. It's like God saying, yes, weddings are fun, and they're huge celebrations, but they're not just fun. They're huge celebrations because they're the beginning of something major, something so good, something that will reorient the trajectory of your life, not just for you, but for whole communities of people, right? Israel as a community, humanity as a community. There was a remake of It's a Wonderful Life, which is like a classic in my household. Uh, a number of years ago, it was like a modern kind of remake, um, oh man, I, I, with Nicolas Cage, which is not the same as Jimmy Stewart. But the idea was instead, what if all the good things hadn't happened, right? And one of those things, oh, I'm sorry, what if a lot of good things had happened that didn't happen in his life? And one of those good things was a marriage. What if instead of living on as a single guy into his 40s, what if he'd gotten married to the girl he'd been in love with in his 20s, right? And it reoriented his whole life into a different direction. Right? That's what God is saying biblical weddings do. They reorient the whole trajectory of our lives into eternity. In fact, the prophets in the Old Testament, Isaiah in our reading today, Jeremiah, Hosea, talk about marriage and abundance of wine as symbols of what's going to happen when God comes back and fixes everything that's broken in the world. His redemption and his restoration are like the beginning of a marriage at a wedding party. They're like wine and food in abundance. And boy, do we see it in abundance today, right? We're getting to the end of a wedding party. Oh, yeah, and we've got 180 gallons of wine in the back. Not just a, a little, little cup for cheers at the end of the toast for everyone. God fulfills his promise to Abraham that his people will bless the entire world with the blessing of heaven through his seed. And so it's very fitting. It makes a lot of sense that our Lord's first miracle 
provides abundance of wine at a Jewish wedding. And it's quite fitting that we read this reading today because we're at the beginning of Epiphany Tide, this season of Epiphany. The early church noticed that Jesus was not invited to this wedding after he had already done a bunch of miracles. This is the beginning of his ministry. This is before anyone knew him. He wasn't famous. He's there because he's just one of everybody else in the crowd with his mother. In fact, some of the fathers thought maybe Jesus was invited kind of as the plus one guest with Mary. (laughs) So Jesus is here. He's not famous yet. But what happens is he begins to reveal his glory at this wedding feast. And Epiphany, the season of Epiphany, is all about God's glory being revealed to the world. And that's what we see. A lot happens at this wedding feast, a lot we could talk all morning about, but verse 11, the last verse we read says, this is the first of his signs that Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So what's the take home? Of all that happens this morning in this passage, the biggest thing is the glory of Jesus gets revealed a little bit. They see behind the veil of his humanity to his divinity and his power and his love and his plan to save the world. And his disciples believed. And how is Jesus' glory revealed? His glory is revealed at a party that's run out of wine. So it's a joyful glory that's being revealed. And his glory is revealed through helping the servants in the back room. So it's a humble glory that is revealed to us. And his glory is revealed in light of all the Old Testament prophets who promised that God was coming. So it's a divine glory that we get a glimpse of in this wedding. And we're told that this humble, this joyful, this divine glory led to people believing in him when they witnessed this miracle. And so that's what we're called to this morning too. Because guess what? We are disciples of Jesus. All of us here in this room. It's why we're here, to worship the living God this morning. And so when we witness this miracle through the scriptures, we come to believe. Because we are witnessing joyful, humble, but divine glory through this story. And isn't it beautiful that of all the things God is going to provide for out of his providence, the first miracle is abundance. Jesus goes on to heal all sorts of things, to right all sorts of wrongs. But the first miracle is providing wine. No one's going to die if the wine runs out. This is a joyful gift of abundance, more than they need. So Jesus isn't just bringing us up to baseline just fixing our physical ailments and sin, he's lifting us up into his glory, into his joy, into his beautiful life. And that's what we see in this first miracle. God is saying, I'm generous. I'm joy-filled. I'm loving. And I want to pour that out onto you. So let the wine flow. This is no bottom shelf wine, by the way. I hear that Cana 30 is a very good vintage. Hard to find in this area. But here we are, 2,000 years later, witnessing this through the scriptures, right? What are the scriptures? They're the witness of the apostles handed down to us, right? That's why we hear this is at Cana, and this is, these are people who were there, right? These are historical records being passed down of eyewitnesses, We live in an age where we have access to more eyewitnesses, more data, more information, more access than any other age. More knowledge, and look at Wikipedia, incredible tool, but we can read about more things on our phone, sipping our cup of coffee while we haven't left bed yet, than most people have had access to in a lifetime. A gift, sure. But boy, is there danger in that. I think that we are at serious risk 
of forgetting or not being aware of God's hand behind things in the world today, God's hand in providing for our needs. In the West, we have a culture of self-reliance. Right? One of the major pieces of literature in our national history is called self-reliance. And in many ways, if we're too self-reliant, we forget our reliance on God. We start to think of God as, if we think of him at all, some distant person who showed up, kind of created everything, went back to heaven, wherever in the world that is, far, far away, and he'll come back one day. And in the meantime, we're kind of here taking care of things on our own. I think that is the way even a lot of Christians think about God. He's coming back. It's good news. He was here once. That's why we're all here. In the meantime, boy, we got to figure this out. <laughs> I'm not sure we're doing so good. Instead of the deeply biblical thought that God is a loving father who is here, who is present, constantly watching over us while we slumber, while we're awake, providing for his children at every moment. You see how that's a totally different way of thinking about God and thinking about our needs and our daily life, everything. I think a major hang-up for us in the West today is that we're just so successful. We're affluent, by and large. We're very progressed technologically, and I'm not criticizing these things. Those are all blessings. But they're blessings that we start to take a lot of credit for. We see our own accomplishments and we think, we don't need to ask a God to give us these things anymore. We can do these things for our own. We used to have to pray to heaven, but now we've got science. We've got industry. We've got ability. What's our need for God? Unless we're in crisis, which happens to be when a lot of us come back to faith, isn't it? But otherwise, we, we're, we're okay. We can do things for ourselves. We're self-reliant. There was a state governor early in the pandemic, it doesn't matter who, it was not our own, and he, you know, the numbers had been so high, deaths had been so high, and they were finally ticking down. And everybody in the country was like breathing for the first time in months. And this governor kind of made headlines, he said, uh, the number is down because we brought the number down. God didn't do that, faith didn't do that, well, here's the thing. I think a lot of Christians probably thought when they read that, well, yeah, we did bring the number down. We've done a lot. We have doctors. We have scientists. We've all been making sacrifices. We're wearing these masks. We've all made changes. So we, we did do that, didn't we? Well, here's the thing. This pits God and humanity against each other in competition, right? And one of us gets the credit. Either God gets the credit or we get the credit. So when we do do things, and we do do things, don't we? What does that mean? <laughs> Where's God in the picture then? Does that mean we did it? and So we did it. God doesn't get the credit. That's what this governor, and I think a lot of Christians even, kind of are struggling with. Do I get the credit, or does God get the glory? How does that work? Well, here's the thing. That isn't really what we see in the wedding at Cana. I think the Bible says, well, that's a funny question to ask. <laughs> Let's ask a different question. Okay, that's what the Bible often does for us. It teaches us to ask different questions, to look at life differently. And here's a great moment, the wedding at Cana. What do we see? Jesus doesn't tell the servants, all right, just go look in the wineskins in the back. You're going to be surprised what you find. Kind of like a cool magic trick. And then there's wine out of nowhere. Jesus has these servants participate in the miracle. Right? He has the servants participate in his miracle. The water turns into wine in part because the servants play a role. They fill the jars with water. They draw the water out of the jars. Right? They have a role to play. They don't make the miracle happen, but they're participating with what Jesus is doing. And then they take it to the master of the feast. And that invitation to participate in the miracle tells us a lot 
about how God has chosen to work, how God has chosen to bless his creation. Not just miracles, but all good things in the world, the things that we don't think of as miracles. And we call all of those things providence. I'm going to do it with you just what I did with the kids. Say it with me. Providence. It's a word that we've lost. We've forgotten. It's such an important word. It needs to come back into our vocabulary. So when something comes about through hard work on our part, yes, it is the fruit of our labor. Absolutely. And yes, it is providence from God. See how that eliminates the competition. It eliminates the question of, wait, which side of the scale gets points? That's not how the Bible works. Not how the Bible tells us God works. St. Thomas Aquinas, as often as the case, is very helpful here. He calls this first and second causes, right? And that may sound technical, but it's really, really super important. He says, our work is the real cause of the fruit we receive. Our labor leads to fruit. But our labor is only possible because of God. Our ability to think, to reason, to have skills, our very life, the fact that we exist moment to moment is because of the first cause of God. And that means we're not in competition with God. All things happen from God's goodness. Just like the servants and their work at the wedding party in the back room, they did the work because of God. And because of the work, there was wine. And good wine, it turns out. And when we recognize that, that everything we do, all our hard work and the fruit we have, is still a blessing from God. We can water the plant, but it's God who makes the plant grow. (laughs) Otherwise, we'd just be watering rocks. Don't try it. It doesn't end well. When we recognize this, we're moved to gratitude. Morning and evening prayer in the prayer book both end with a prayer called the General Thanksgiving. It's one of the greatest prayers in the Anglican tradition. It has some wonderful lines. Here are two really good ones. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. So God didn't just create us. He's not just coming back to save us. He preserves us every second that we exist through all the blessings of this life. And so we bless God for that. And then we pray in this prayer, Lord, give us such an awareness of your mercy. Translation, don't let us ever take too much credit for the blessings in our life. Give us such an awareness of your mercy that with truly thankful hearts, we show forth your praise. Right? We start with blessing, we end with blessing, because we don't take credit for any of it at the end of the day, even when we're called to work really hard. I kind of think of God's role with us as a bonsai tree. I have a friend whose dad got really in the deep end of bonsai trees. I don't know if you've ever seen these. The little trees, some of them get to be like hundreds of years old. It's not one of those things you just put an ice cube in to water it once a month and let it be. Not a low-maintenance plant. You've got to trim and prune and shape carefully, constantly, watching over it like a newborn child. Right? That is how God nurtures us, constantly watching over us, constantly shaping us. And then that tree looks beautiful and lives sometimes for hundreds of years, something like eternal life right? That's something far more what God's relationship is like than the factory worker who kind of made us and let us go on our way, right? And we come in for maintenance every quarter. (laughs) Not a good way (laughs) to live in relationship with God. A lot of things break down pretty quickly. And when we recognize that, God's care for us, his nurture for us, his blessing for us constantly, we're moved to this gratitude. Bless your name, Lord. We praise you. Don't let us ever forget that everything comes from your hand to us. And we're moved to gratitude. And that way of looking at the the world, 
like those biblical wedding parties, it changes the trajectory of our life. It changes the trajectory of the world. Because when our lives are different, the world changes because of the work we do, because of the work God is doing. Do you see how that chain works? We live differently because God opens our eyes and blesses us. And when we do that, we participate with God changing the world. And what a beautiful thing. We're not just bystanders. I mean, what a privilege that God says, come, I'm saving the world, which is, by the way, the biggest Hollywood industry right now, superheroes. Right? Apparently, people love this stuff. Guess what? I'm doing it. And I'm not just doing it. I want you to join me. <laughs> I want you to participate with me in saving the world. Are you game? Come on. That's the invitation of the Bible. That's the invitation of the wedding of Cana to the disciples when they believe. I mean, this is an epic story. So my prayer for us as a community of Christians here as we go into Epiphany Tide is that the miracle of the wedding of Cana gives you hope and gives you gratitude. Hope and gratitude because hope and gratitude reset the trajectory of our lives. Let's look at each of these briefly. First, I pray that this miracle gives you hope in seemingly impossible situations in the world. Our nation, this weekend, every year, remembers a pastor, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and the work that he did. Why? Because he's an icon of the fight for hope, for racial justice, for equality, for reconciliation. Now, a lot of things have happened in the 50 years since he was murdered. A lot of things happened in the 100 years from the Civil War to his life. But pick up a newspaper. Right? Listen to your, your friends over conversation or coffee. There's surely a lot left needed on these issues. So racial justice and reconciliation remain prominent, serious issues that we're wrestling with as a nation and certainly beyond us. This is not an American issue. It's a human issue throughout history. And that simply hasn't changed today. But Martin Luther King was not just a human voice changing society. Martin Luther King was a pastor who saw the heart of God in the Bible for oppressed people. And he saw the power of God to save the world and all its brokenness. And he saw the call for Christians like you and me to come together as brothers and sisters participating in God's work to save the world. That's very different from just human effort. We're joining God in what seems impossible. And when we need a miracle, right? Restoration, racial reconciliation, an end to violence and division. It's very easy to get discouraged and despair. It's also very easy to say, you know what, I'm tired, I'm done, it's never going to happen, we're just going to move on and act like it's not a thing, right? Despair and apathy are the easy choices. The hard choice is the one that we're called to, even from this, this gospel miracle today. We can say, okay, wait, we need a miracle. Oh, good, we believe in the God of miracles. <laughs> okay, so let's ask, what is God's heart for this situation in our nation? How is he calling Christians to join him the way that he called the servants to join him at the wedding in Cana to bring about a miracle? We only do that if we really have hope, if we really believe, like the disciples, that Jesus is who he said, that he did what he did, that he is the God of miracles, of joy and power. I think our pandemic's another great opportunity for this. Our COVID numbers in Kitsap are higher than they've ever been. I mean, literally off the chart. They had to like quintuple the height of the chart to get the numbers where they were last week. Omicron is everywhere. It is everywhere. I've had phone calls from people all over town and all over the country in the last two weeks who are sick. We can either despair, and that's easy to do, or we can say, you know what, I'm done. I'm tired. We're just pretending it's not a thing. 
we're back to despair and apathy. Or we can ask the harder question, what is God's heart in this? What is he inviting us to do? Just like he invited the servants at Cana to do, what's he inviting us to do to bring about the miracle that we need? Because my goodness, are we tired of this? Are we tired of this? I am tired of this. We need a miracle. Oh, wait. (laughs) Good. We believe in the God of miracles. We just have to ask him, what's your heart for this? What are you doing amidst this? What are you calling us to do to participate with you? That requires hope. That requires hope. So I pray that the wedding of Cana gives you hope in the very difficult situations of this world and of your individual life. Whatever very hard things you might be living through right now, health, family, economy, who knows? God bless you with hope. Also, may you have gratitude in your heart. It's difficult to find Jesus in all these social issues sometimes. It also can be difficult to see Jesus in all the little things of our life that we take for granted, that we take credit for, that we're the secondary cause of. Car in our driveway, little money in our bank account, food on our dining room table. Did we work hard for those things? Well, sure, yeah, absolutely. We're not denying that. But St. Thomas Aquinas and the Bible and the wedding of Cana remind us, what made your hard work possible? What made you possible? The providence of God. The providence of God. So what do we do? We keep working hard, just like we're called to do, certainly. Work is not a curse, it's a blessing. To use our gifts, to have talent, to be in community, but amidst that hard work, we thank God for all the blessings of this life because we recognize every little thing we have is God saying, hey, I love you. Hey, I care about you. Hey, I know your needs, and I want you to have this thing. What that means is God is revealing his glory to us, not just in the miracles, but even in the small things. An epiphany is all about God revealing his glory to us. So let everything, from difficult problems in our society to your morning cup of coffee, reveal the glory of Jesus Christ to you today. He loves you, and he is the God of miracles and providence. God bless you.